So, anyway, so, welcome to a new little bit that a friend of mine and I are going to do on his channel on YouTube sometime in the future. I don't know exactly when, but sometime in the future, a friend of mine and I are going to get together and do, th and do this again. Book versus film. And when we do this together, we're going to be, uh, you know, much better than this because he actually knows how to show clips from the things I'm talking about. And uh, I don't have that capability. However, while, this, while the bit will be called book versus film... This is adaptation versus adaptation. An adaptation means something that's based on something else. Like a movie based on a book. And so, of course, people would assume, oh, well, you would assume because there's a certain book series I talk about a lot on my channel. The Maximum Ride series, one of my favorite books of all time. I'm afraid this is not that. In fact, if you can see by the title, it's Compare and, contra compare and Contrast, M.A.S.H. and M.A.S.H. Notice those little symbols between the letters in the second one. That's the TV series. We're going to be comparing the movie and the television show. This is the M.A.S.H. television show. And, um... Yeah, this is season seven of the television show. The, as for the movie, um, one second. As for the movie. And this is the original MASH movie from 1970. Yeah, I say 1900, I should just say 1970, but who cares. So comparing and contrasting the movie the movie, and the television series. Both of these are based on a book. When you say MASH, most people are going to think you mean you know, basically the TV show, because it's more because it's better known, it, it has a bigger audience. More people remember the TV show than they do the movie. And the TV show lasted a long time, from 1972 to 1983. The TV show is based on the movie, and the movie is based on a book. The book is titled M.A.S.H., a novel about three army doctors. I believe I've compared and contrasted these before, but I don't think I've ever done it on YouTube. And if I have, well, sue me. So, what's the big story? Well, the book was written by Richard Hornberger. Yeah, I don't know how to fully pronounce his surname. Some say it's pronounced Hornberger, others think, yeah, because, like, look at the spelling of the guy's name. It's in the description. The guy's name is in the description. So, so but he used a pseudonym when he published the book, the pseudonym of Richard Hooker. Not much of a step up. Up. Moving on. So, he wrote the book titled M.A.S.H., a novel about three army doctors. These three army doctors are, Hawk, are Captain Benjamin Franklin Hawkeye Pierce. No, not like Marvel's Hawkeye. In fact, if you listen to the television show, he received the nickname from his father given the nickname after the character in the book, Last of the Mohicans. Richard Hornberger said, nah, it's just a nickname. And so the story of the book is that Hawkeye Pierce and Duke Forrest arrive at a new MASH unit commanded by the longtime Army career officer, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Blake. Among the various characters in the MASH unit are their Catholic chaplain, Father, Fran Father Francis Dago Red Mulcahy, 
His nickname comes from, uh, well, his nickname is from the fact that he's half Irish, half Italian. He's half Irish, half Italian. The, it's kind of a derogatory term for people who are half Irish, half Italian. But he takes his nickname in strides for some reason. Their camp dentist, Captain Walter Painless Waldowski, they call him the Painless Pole because, you know, his family is Polish. I mean, with a surname like Waldowski, what can you expect? And he's painless because, well, he's an army dentist. So you can guess where the painless part comes in. Well, and, of course, their hyper-competent company chief clerk. In mass units, there were like seven company clerks, but Radar was the chief clerk. Radar O'Reilly. Later on, and of course, the incompetent surgeon Frank Burns, better known by his nickname of Ferret Face, a well-deserved nickname. And later on, two more characters show up. Their chest surgeon, Captain Trapper John McIntyre, who Hawkeye knew in college, and their new chief nurse, Major Margaret Hotlips Houlihan. Pardon my foul language, but there's only one way to describe Hotlips Houlihan in the original book. And what is that way? It's three words. And they use these three words constantly in the book and the movie. Regular army bitch. You know, I apologize for the language, but that's what those are the words they use. So, so to continue on, the novel is an episodic novel. No real central storyline except it's a mass unit in Korea. And something most people don't realize is mass units were a real thing. They were developed in the final days of World War II, and, they, and they've been used in Korea, Vietnam, sometime in the Middle East. But the last mass unit was historically decommissioned, the very last mass unit of all, fully decommissioned in the February of 2006. What a mass unit is, is basically an acronym, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. As for what purpose they served, well, in the battlefield there are some wounds that an army field medic just can't do. You need a surgeon to do it. And that's what mass units were for. A group of entirely drafted surgeons, nurses, and everybody else. The only person who isn't drafted is their chaplain. For those who don't know, chaplain is their on-site religious leader. Like uh, an example, Father Mulcahy, Catholic priest. He's, there, he's the chaplain of the mass unit in the book. And the film and the TV show. So... What else happens? Well, okay, so, again, my friend has seen the movie, so he knows most of what goes on. But to continue on with the book, and the book is not that different from the movie, but drastically different from the TV show. So, first off, let's compare. What's similar? It's the Korean War. The mass unit's number is the same, 4077. And a few of the characters are kept, you know, in, in the same character as the books. There's really not much to compare, as it's drastically different. The only real thing I can say that is similar are, that I can say are similar, are just what I said. The characters' names are the same. A few of the characters are somewhat the same as they are in the book and film. And it takes place in a mass unit during the Korean War. Aside from that, that's about it. 
there's very little, almost nothing in common between the book and the television show. Whereas the movie is almost exactly the same. But let's take some show let's take some contrast. And there's a lot of contrast. Mainly, the movie was made just so filmmakers could do something new. The movie came out in the year 1970. And at this time, every filmmaker was doing the exact same thing. People were used to it. People liked it. They just did what people liked. MASH was something new. Some, and something new is not typically what filmmakers want to do. Typically, they want to stick to what they know, stick with what the people like. Something that they've never seen before was considered a bad idea. And unfortunately, it appears Hollywood has gone back to that standard of thinking. Okay. And so... Uh, and so, to continue on, but the movie was really only made just to make a movie. And it called things into question. Like, like it called the purpose of war into question. It called, sexu it called certain sexualities into question. And finally, it called into question the U.S. and Vietnam. Which is not what any of it intended to do. They just intended to do something, something, something to make a good movie. And they did. The next, however, the TV show was made by the TV studios. Tell me, this sounds kind of stupid when you say it out loud, but it's what they did. They wanted to use a television show to protest the Vietnam War. Yeah, just, just say that aloud for a second and tell me how stupid it sounds. Using a TV show to protest Vietnam. Have you, have you said it? Have you said, if you have, leave it in the comments how stupid that sounds when you say it aloud. So you would expect this to be a bad show since it's meant to protest something that TV shows can't really help out with. But no, it is quite a good TV show. If you don't believe me, ask the people who watched it while it was on TV. And continuing on, Continuing on, so what else is different? There's the purpose it was made, but we have to look at the characters' portrayals. So let's look at our main character, the principal character, as it's called. Hawkeye Pierce. Now, one of the book's critics, as well as the author of the book, Richard Hohenberger, yeah, until I learn the proper pronunciation, that's what I'm going to say is Hohenberger, until I learn the proper pronunciation. Noted that the TV screens made Hawkeye seem a bit more liberal than he is in the books. And we have to remember that the author based Hawkeye mostly off of himself. To a point where, while he did call his tent while he was in Korea the swamp, he was politically conservative. Yeah, everyone notes this. His colleagues, those who were with him in the MASH unit, and even himself. And, of course, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet. That's a dumb idea. But if those of you who want to check Wikipedia, check Wikipedia. Tell me what it says about him. And then, so, what else is there to say? So, Hawkeye Pierce is portrayed in the book and the film as this boozing, womanizing, womanizing, somewhat degenerate, but still probably one of the one of the damn finest surgeons ever to walk the earth. <sighs> He's insubordinate. He doesn't get. Pardon my foul language, but I'm going to tell you something I heard once. He doesn't give two fucks about military protocol. 
Apple. He just wants to do his job as a surgeon and then go back to his hometown of Crabapple Cove, Maine. And those of you thinking, yes, Crabapple Cove is a fictitious town, a fictional town in the state of Maine. And that's all that Hawkeye Pierce wants to do is he wants to operate on his patients, save their lives, and hopefully get discharged from the army, which he hates ridiculously, and go back to Maine. That's all he wants to do. And, and of course, that's kind of the same with both of the actors who portrayed him. Donald Sutherland in the movie, and Alan Alda on TV. It's kind of true in... It's kind of true in both of them that that's all he wants to do, is operate, have some beer, and go home. However, here are the big differences. Donald Sutherland portrays Hawkeye Pierce again the way the book portrays him. He boozes a lot, he plays poker... He's not exactly very friendly to anyone who's regular army, particularly he is not friendly to Hot Lips, Houlihan, and Frank Burns. But again, he's more conservative. In fact, in one page of the book, he even refers to, and I quote, quote, beating the bejesus out of lefties to make them stay in line. This line is never said in the movie. Or the, or the show, thank God. But... Again, he's more conservative. And for those of you thinking, well, didn't the conservatives send us to Korea? Yeah, no, that was Democratic President Harry S. Truman who sent us into Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Harry the dumbass Truman. Moving on. So... So... The So, as well, in the movie and the book, Hawkeye is married and has children. In the TV show, he's a bachelor. In the, in the, in the movie and the book, he used to play football at his old college. In the TV series, he's non-athletic. And last but and last but not least, Alan Alda's Hawkeye Pierce will go to whatever lengths he needs to to protest the war, to talk about how much he does not like the army and how much he wants to go home. Even poking jokes at the army, particularly Truman and General MacArthur. Donald Sutherland never does any of this. His version of Hawkeye Pierce knows that for his insubordination and boozing, he has the army over a barrel, and he enjoys every last damn second of it. Of it. He doesn't enjoy being in the army, and this is seen clearly, but he knows he has him over a barrel, and he never stops enjoying it. Are there points where we see him not liking the situation he's in? Oh, certainly, certainly. But of course, he's dramatically different from Alan Alda's portrayal. He doesn't protest the war, he doesn't protest the army, he doesn't really protest anything. He still makes up lies and often cheats to get his way. But in Korea, what else can you do? Okay, so, th so that's the main character, Hawkeye Pierce. That sounds kind of like a simplistic character, but again, you you gotta you gotta actually watch this stuff to know what I'm talking about and. The MASH film is becoming very difficult to find. I didn't get my copy at a store. I got my copy from a family friend who just so happens to know where you can find some older movies. 
Like again, this came out in 1970, so it's very difficult to find today. So I didn't get my DVD of it from a store. However, in stores I've been in, most particularly the most particularly Second and Charles, it's becoming more common. Like they had, like last time I was at a Second and Charles, they had a copy, but you know, not sure if it's still there. So, to move on, to move on. So, that's Hawkeye Pierce. What about the rest of our characters? Well, they're all, well, most of them are dramatically different. And one thing that really pisses off diehard fans of the movie, including myself, is that Duke Forrest, our third surgeon, was kept out of the show. Well, he was a racist in the movie. Okay, um, Richard Hornberger himself described Duke as the small-town southerner of his time. And for those of you who don't know when the Korean War was going on, it was from 1950 to 1953. During the 50s and well into the 60s and 70s, the South, and yes, Duke is from Georgia, was not exactly a good time for black people. The South was not a good place in that time for African Americans. They still had that whole colored patrons restroom crap. Yep, a few of them still, a few places in the South still do. But again, you got to look at that small town southerner, and then the key words of his time. In the modern day, most southern people don't give a crap what color you are, but the South is portrayed as being a lot friendlier. But again, that's the key word there is most southerners of the modern day. Modern day. During the 50s, the character of Duke is 100% accurate what the South was like in the 50s. Particularly the early 50s. And besides, even for his racist remarks, Trapper and Duke, no, sorry, Hawkeye and Trapper still punish Duke for his remarks, both in the book and in the movie. Movie. And I don't ever hear Duke say a racist thing once in the whole movie. When, movie, when he, when he, when he says, oh yeah, Dr. Harmon Jones, he's that, N-word, boy who used to, boy who used to play for the Fort, for the San Francisco 49ers. I remember that. But you know, again, small town southerner of the time. Of the time. The South has not always been. The South has been that way for a long time. They're starting to heal, but now some new idiots are coming up. Moving on. So. Why was Duke kept out of the TV show? And you can't say it's a racist thing, because it's the southern United States. And MASH, the TV show, had no trouble portraying racist characters. After all, they kept Frank Burns around, and he's racist towards everything that's not white. I mean, go back and watch the show and listen to how Frank Burns talks to the local Koreans. You will not be surprised. And, then, and also, again, like, Frank Burns is... For a brief point in the show, prejudice towards Native Americans. So. so if you can keep Frank Burns around, and he's a racist character, why not Duke, who is just, you know, a southerner of the time? Hmm? And if you're going to say Burns is racist for the same thing, he's actually not. The book and the show, it's never mentioned in the film, both confirm that Burns is from Fort Wayne, Indiana. So yeah, racism ain't only in the South. You can find it anywhere. It's a shame that you can, but fortunately you can. And that Southern and that stereotype that all Southern people are racist. I'll say something. I got relatives who are Southern, born and raised in the South. And again, they don't care what color you are. They just care about the value of your character. 
That's it. Anyway, back to MASH. So, the re others will say that, like, there was a rumor that the TV show's creator, Larry Gilbert, I think his name is, G-E-L-B-A-R-T, I think it's Gilbert, I'd, I'd have to check. There's a rumor that he was prejudiced towards Southern people himself, and so he didn't like Duke because he was from Georgia. So, there was that. Others say it was a budget matter, that they already had so many characters that adding Duke would just add to the budget, and they didn't have a very big budget. To which I call bullshit. If they can have a TV show that lasts in the last 11 years, I'd call bullshit on them having a small budget. And then others just say, well... They actually asked Tom Skerritt, the actor who played Duke in the movie, to reprise the role for the TV show. And he said no. He declined. He said, I don't think a TV show would get a large following. And yet, as much as other shows would want to deny this and say their fan base is bigger, MASH has the biggest fan base on Earth. And if not on Earth, I will say this, has the biggest fan base I've ever seen. And according to some sources, it's got more than any TV show that has ever aired. So, anyway. So, yeah, why was Duke kept out of the TV show? Was it solely because Tom Skerritt declined and they couldn't see anyone else in the role? Was it because Larry Gilbert was prejudiced towards the South? Is there any confirmation of that? Or was it solely the money? Just the budget? Who knows? We, ne we probably never will. <laughs> okay, so how else are the characters different? Then you have Hawkeye's best friend, Trapper John McIntyre, who's only around for three of the 11 seasons of the show. How is Elliot Gould's portrayal different from Wayne Rogers' portrayal? In the book and the film, Trapper has this cynical, sardonic sense of humor. Yes, sardonic. S-A-D-O-N-I-C. I don't know what it means either. But in the TV show, he's the stereotypical class clown. And a lot of Duke Forrest's traits are put into the TV show's Trapper. Yeah, so you kept Duke himself out, but put a few of his traits into Trapper. I don't understand that. And so, why did Wayne Rogers, who played Trapper on TV, why did he leave and become replaced? Well, he left because of the episode House Arrest, where Alan Alda's Hawkeye Pierce was much closer to the book's Hawkeye Pierce where he punched Frank Burns in the face, got rewarded for it with a steak, and did not share the steak with anyone else, and then proceeded to mock Frank Burns after Burns himself was put under house arrest. Okay, um, given what we know of Frank Burns, point one, he deserves it. Point two, why is it such a bad thing? Hell, Richard Hornberger said publicly that he despised the MASH TV show. There was even a rumor that he went on to the studio one day, walked up to the TV show creator, and yelled, I hate you. You are ruining everything I've ever written. And I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. He did publicly state that he hated the show. It, he felt like it was a mockery of what he wrote. And even his family, years after his death, confirms this. They, confirms, they confirm that every day, whenever the show was on, they, he would yell at them to change the channel. Because he didn't like it. And there are two rumors about him and the studio. Point one, that he told Larry Gilbert that he hated him. And rumor two, he often threatened to use what little contacts he has in the network. And seeing as how these characters are his property, 
he wrote the book they came from, so they're his property, he could have the show canceled at any time. And he threatened that if they didn't do an episode closer to what he wrote, he would use all what little power he had and have the show canceled. And if not canceled, he'd at least get someone fired, someone important in the show. So therefore, the episode House Arrest, which is much closer to the book, they did in season three. In fact, I believe there's at least one episode per season that is at least somewhat closer to the book and film. That's what I believe, but I don't have every season. I just have the first seven and the ninth one and the show's finale. That's about all I have. I don't have the whole series. See, and then as for the contrast between all the characters, another thing about Trapper John McIntyre, well, Wayne Rogers left. He left because the episode House Arrest is supposedly the one that created a rift between Alan Alda and the rest of the cast. It's only because he portrayed the character of Hawkeye closer to the books, a little too close to the book for their liking. Okay, well, that's not his fault. That's really the fault of the writers, isn't it? And after seeing the episode House Arrest and looking at his contract for season four, Wayne Rogers found that he was becoming more of a sidekick. And he didn't want to do that. So he left production. Excuse me. What about the commanding officer, good old Henry Blake? Oh, he is the most dramatically different of all. Henry Blake. In the novel and film, Henry Blake is a commissioned officer. In fact, he himself says twice in the film, and I assume the book, that he, that he says, and I quote, since the dark days before Pearl Harbor, I have been proud to wear this uniform. So he's been a commissioned so he became a commissioned officer shortly before World War II. Okay, the United States' involvement in World War II, I mean. So, what about Henry Blake in the T? And in the book, Henry Blake is a longtime commissioned officer the strict commanding officer, the man you would expect to run a military unit, and often stutters when angry. In the movie, the stuttering was taken out because, you know, couldn't, God forbid, we offend anybody. Buddy? So his stuttering when angry was taken out. And then, of course, you have... Like the, the incredible, dramatic difference between the Henry Blake of the movie and the Henry Blake of the show. In the television show, Henry Blake is this recently drafted guy, one of the finest surgeons from his home state of Illinois. Illinois. He's a good surgeon, a devoted family man. Family man. One of the best men you could ever know, but not a good commanding officer. To a point where all he can do as a commanding officer is keep up morale, which for those who don't want, don't know, means he can keep the people under his command in good spirits. But that's about all he can do is keep them in good spirits and operate as a surgeon. He's a fine surgeon, he keeps them in good spirits, but he's not a good commanding officer. In fact, in the show, he was the athletic trainer for the University of Illinois football team before going into medical practice. And is that really a good idea? To, like, I get it. During Korea, we were drafting everyone. We were drafting everyone we could get our hands on. And the same for World War, both of the World Wars, the Civil War, and the Revolution. However, it doesn't make sense to me that you'd put an athletic trainer in charge of a medical unit. Granted, he was now a surgeon, but he knows nothing about military protocol. And Hornberger said that a lot of the people he knew were based on real people. A lot of the people he wrote 
are based on the people he knew in his own ash unit, the 8055. And so he based Henry Blake off of his own commanding officer, who had all the same traits that Henry does in the book. Long-time officer, been there since shortly before Pearl Harbor. Remember? And that's kind of it. Like, and even the stuttering and anger, that was the, the corner hand, that was there too. So... He felt kind of insulted that they'd taken his commanding officer, who he had respected, and made him a mockery. And so... And then the next thing... However, he did applaud when they killed him off. Yeah, in the final episode of in the final episode of season three, the final appearance of Henry Blake. Henry Blake on the television show. The actor who played Henry Blake on TV, McLean Stevenson, left for the same reason that Wayne Rogers did. He was becoming a side character. He'd be he would just be paid to just stand there and not say a thing. And he was a professionally trained actor. So just stand there and say nothing felt kind of wrong. And, and so he decided to leave and go start his own show. And then, of course, the writers were like, all right, let's do it. But of course, Hornberger was still getting angry at the show. So they called him up and asked him what he would do. And he helped write off that they would kill off Henry Blake. Because, you know, his own commanding officer died sometime during the war. And now that Henry Blake was getting a discharge and going back to Bloomington, Illinois, well, it seemed like the perfect time. Ironically, that is the third of the three most hated MASH episodes is Henry Blake getting killed off. The actors, actresses, the, the cast, and the crew would all receive hate letters from the fans on how much they hated that they killed Henry Blake. To which they always replied, no, the war, the Vietnam War, that's what killed him. There was even one girl, I don't remember her name, who wrote to them and said that Henry's death was more real to her than the death of her own father in the Vietnam War. Which, you know, I somewhat understand. Henry was a well-beloved character, and also, put yourself in her shoes. You get a, a telegram from someone in the army that your father is dead. You, you just wouldn't believe it. So, and so, moving on, so, it's just dramatically different. Another big, di and then of course, what about Radar O'Reilly and the other characters? Well, most of the characters from the book... Some of them are referenced once, but are never seen, and they're only referenced once and then never again. Others are seen for only season one. What about Burns? Does he change any? Not in the damn slightest. Not in the damn slightest. Now, looking at Robert Duvall in the MASH movie and Larry Linville on the show, the, the actors who portrayed Frank Burns... I look and I see the exact same freaking character. I don't see any difference. And if you do, please let me know what it is. What about Radar? Is he different? Mm. 
Well, yeah. In the film, not only is he a good clerk, but he's also, he's a, he freshly graduated high school when they drafted him. Which is, you know, like in book, film, and show, he fresh out of high school when he was drafted. But he's also kind of like the typical soldier. Soldier. He does his work and does it efficiently. He can... Efficiently. And he has a little fun when the commanding officer is not looking. By fun, I mean, you know, doing what Hawkeye, Trapper, and Duke do, as well as taking Colonel Blake's cigars and and drinking his brandy. However, on the TV show, he's more of the simple Iowa farm boy. Very naive, very young, very misplaced. Like the young face of someone who's going through war for the first time and is just about as innocent as the, as the children who live near their mash unit. And then, if, but again, Hornberger said, you know, based on a real person, kind of insulted him. And then, of course, finally you have good old Margaret Houlihan. How is she different? In the book and the film, Mar Major Houlihan, referred to as Major O. Houlihan in the movie, don't ask me why, I don't know. Oh, why they add the typical O to it, I believe it's because she's of Irish ancestry and big stereotypes that all Irish names begin with O somewhere. Moving on, you know, as, as a person of Irish, of partial Irish descent myself, you know, the Irish, Scottish, Dutch, etc. Moving on. I found that person, you know, personally insulting. But to continue, um, how is Margaret different? Well. She in the in the film and the book, she is never called by her first name. Only, nor really do they ever call her major either, despite that being her appropriate rank. They always refer to her by her nickname, Hot Lips. And after such, however, in the show, she starts off again the exact same character, the same three words, regular army bitch. But then, as time goes on, the rift grows between her and her adulterer, Frank Burns. Yeah, Burns commits adultery. Sorry for the spoiler. He commits it with Margaret all the time. But from season four onward, the rift begins to grow between the two of them. In fact, this rift is actually shown quite well in a season two episode called Hot Lips and Empty Arms. But I won't go into detail on that. About season five, Margaret gets engaged to another officer, which, you know, Frank doesn't like because that means his only source of sex in, the, in Korea is going to stop having sex with him. <laughs> and this is where she starts to improve. She forms a bit of a friendship with Hawkeye and Trapper's replacement, B.J. Honeycutt, played by Mike Farrell. And yeah, you know, she we she begins to become more human, and the nickname Hot Lips actually dies out. More people just either call her by her rank, or more commonly, first name. So that's about all you can say there. And, and personally, I think like a lot of people, I prefer the show's Major Houlihan to the movie's Major Houlihan. And it's nothing against the actress, Sally Kellerman, who played her in the movie. I got none against her. She does the role very fine. But it's the character, it's, it's the character herself. Again, Major Houlihan's personality in the book and the film is, I hate to keep repeating this, but that's all she is, is regular army bitch. In the show, she is only this way because, as is explained, she grew up in the military. Her father was a World War I veteran. Veteran who continued to serve in the army until he got too old. 
So, so, and she assumes everyone is like that because, you know, she grew up in that way of thinking. And she, and she, and she's just trying to do her job in an area that really won't let her do it the way she wants to do it. So they, and, but as time goes on, she begins to realize that these are people, not machines. And unlike her, they did not ask to be there. And so, and eventually she becomes, she gets better as time goes on. Whereas her adulterer, Major Frank Burns, is a one-dimensional character. Like, seriously, looking back on the film and the show, I understand why everyone rejoiced when we heard we were never going to be seeing him again. And why everyone slammed their fist against the table at what the writers of the show did with him. Anyway, that's the characters as far as I can give you. Other compare and contrast? Well... Again, the replacement characters. Four actors left production on the MASH TV show. Wayne Rogers, who played Trapper. McLean Stevenson, who played Henry Blake. Larry Linville, who played Frank Burns. And, excuse me, and Gary Berghoff, who played Radar in both the movie and the show. He's the only actor on... He, Radar is the only character in MASH to have been played by the same actor in both incarnations. And so, that's about almost all I can say there. So, why did they leave, respectively? Well, for McLean Stevenson and Wayne Rogers, it's because they were starting to dislike Alan Alda and didn't like that they were becoming side characters. That they'd have to play second fiddle to a man that neither of them really liked that much. They didn't like that. So they just, so they left production. And they they were and Trapper was replaced by BJ Honeycutt, a devoted family man who would never cheat on his wife, unlike Trapper, and like everyone else, just wants to go home. And will even help Hawkeye in his protests of being in the army, being drafted, and the war itself. And Henry Blake is replaced by Colonel Sherman T. Potter, another World War I veteran, and World War II as well, man of both world wars, longtime army officer, and basically everything that Henry Blake was, except also, not only is he army, he's also human. He doesn't let the military control his whole life. He's a, he's a fine surgeon, an excellent human being, and, and a brilliant military officer. And then, of course, as for why Larry Linville, who played Frank Burns, left. He left because in the season five finale, Margaret got married. And Larry Linville said, and I quote, I felt I had done everything I could with the character. <sighs> well, all right. And we were happy to frickin' see him go. We had, no one has anything against Larry Linville. No one has anything against the actor. What we do have against is Frank Burns. I don't know a single person who liked Frank Burns. Like, seriously, he's not a good character. And from what I hear and from what I've seen, he is mostly just this one-dimensional character. Overly military... Harry cheating on his wife, life yet blaming others when they do something like that. Constantly bringing up his wife in front of his mistress, even though he knows that's going to anger her. Everything that is basically wrong with human beings, that's about it. So... Moving on. Um, 
So yeah, with Frank Burns, I never saw much difference with everyone else, plenty, and I think others saw it too. So who was Burns replaced by? Well, the actor was replaced by David Ogden Stiers, who just passed away this year, March 3rd, and is well known for playing in Cogsworth in the animated Disney movie Beauty and the Beast, as well as a number of other Disney roles. And the character is Major Charles Emerson Winchester III. Or as my grandmother likes to call him, Major Charles Emerson Pompous Ass Winchester III of the Boston Pompous Ass Winchesters. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so Winchester had a few of the same qualities as Burns. Also, he was, again, a much better character. He was three-dimensional. He was, he was rich and often let that get the better of him, but he was always quick to give his money when others needed it. And unlike Burns, he actually liked children. You know, like local Korean children, he spent, a lot, he spent enough money as he could to buy them chocolate. He was outraged when it was stolen but when he found that, but when he found that the ch the children had traded it for actual food, he said, "'Twas I who was selfish for giving des for giving dessert to children who had had no meal." Yeah. Winchester is much preferable to Burns in every single way. And then, of course, Radar. Why did he leave? Well, by the time of season six, the show had started to cause him family problems. And that's the rule about life is family first. Family for anything else. And then, well, at season eight, when he left, he'd started to face burnout. Think about it. He started playing the character back in 1970. And by the time he left, it was around, I think, 1979. So he'd been playing this character for nine years. And so now he was just getting tired of it. And so he left. I was replaced by a character that had actually been on the show since episode four, not season four, but episode four. Corporal Maxwell Q. Klinger, who'd been who'd been a crossdresser, as hopes to getting a Section Eight. Section Eight is a discharge that was used in World War II. It's still used in the military today, actually. Which you know, if you're not right in the head, they send you home. And that's what Klinger was hoping to get. He kept wearing women's clothing to get a Section Eight discharge, so that everyone would think he's crazy. That, you know, Everyone would think he's crazy, he'd get a Section 8, he'd go home. And he never got it. If you want to convince people you're crazy, you're going to have to do more than just wear women's clothes. Oddly enough, that's becoming more common now. So, so that's what happened there. And these characters, Hornberger didn't hate them, but he didn't like that a lot of what he wrote was not in the show. So that's one big contrast is, while the author was okay with the movie, he despised this show. Particularly, he despised Alan Alda in his portrayal of Hawkeye. See, Hornberger never intended to write anti-war anything. He never intended to make people laugh. He intended to tell people what Korea was like and how we shouldn't forget it. To show people that he went through it, and though he did slightly fictionalize what happened, it's stuff he's not going to forget. And he doesn't want the world to forget either. That it's that to show that people, that the human spirit is present in all of us, even in the worst of times. So when his book got turned into a 
an anti-war drama slash comedy to protest a war that he actually publicly stated that he did not care about Vietnam. He said he was just glad he didn't have to go there. He'd been through war once. He didn't want to do it again. So he really, so he really didn't care about protesting Vietnam in the slightest. All he wanted to do was write a book about what happened in Korea and hope that they liked it, and a lot of them did, and others didn't. It stems with every book. And he, and he based Hawkeye, again, off of himself. And so to see himself be represented, not as how he intended, but as this clown who just would stop at nothing to protest how much he hates the army and do the right thing, which, you know, again, he liked, you know, doing the right thing. He was a surgeon after all, but he didn't like, but in Korea, doing the right thing often didn't matter. Like, like often he had to resort to larceny to get a job done. And while this is shown in MASH, it's really not, it's, it's really not as much as it was historically. I don't know if Alan Alda and Richard Hornberger ever personally met. I don't know if he personally told him he hated him. All I know is that he hated the show and he hated Alan Alda. I myself don't get why as well, I personally like Alan Alda. Do I prefer him to Donald Sutherland? Huh? Not really. I mean, I don't have a preference of the two. I think they both do great in the character they have to portray. But moving on, another big contrast is okay, is Hawkeye Pierce and Duke Forrest in the film and the show. That's our show. No, Duke's not in the show. In the film and the book, they get their discharge orders and go home. In the show, that's how they explain Trapper leaving, is he got his discharge, which did not happen in the book. Another one, and of course, in another contrast, but this one's not that major. In the book and the film, Trapper is Chief Surgeon, not Hawkeye. In the show, Henry Blake names Hawkeye Pierce Chief Surgeon of the unit. Which, you know, I'll go into detail if any, later if anyone ever asks me to make a video about MASH units, but still... And then, of course, and then of course the final one, which is really the big one, in the in the book and the movie, the Korean War does not end. That's how the TV show ends: is it's the last day of the Korean War, and at midnight that night, look, okay, not midnight, I think around 10 a.m. the next day, the war is over, and everyone can go home. And that's what they do. The movie and the book are both set in 1951 and 1951 alone. Not 1953, when the Korean War came to an end. But 51. And while Hawkeye and Duke go home, no one else does. Everyone else is stuck there. But what's the big reason that more people remember the MASH show than they would the movie? Well, according to, my, according to people I know, it's because the show is a little bit funnier. The MASH movie is funny. It has its points where it's funny. But, it also, but it's also a mostly serious movie, talking about how Korea actually was. And what our surgeons did when they were off duty. the TV show, and it does go into some details about how Korea actually was, mostly shows our surgeons in how they desperately want to go home. And 
of course, the zany antics they get to along the way of hoping to get home. It's The MASH film is mostly drama with some comedy. The MASH TV show is a dramedy, a perfect mix of drama and comedy. So, as well, a lot of the characters in the MASH movie are kind of forgettable. Like, a MASH unit has historically had ten surgical officers. MASH, the TV show, only has four, but again, that's due to budget. And that part I actually believe. As well... A lot of the character, the other surgeons are mostly pretty bland. We don't see a lot of them. A lot of them, and you forget them just as quickly as you see their names. And then, of course, the biggest contrast for me is how they got rid of Frank Burns. In the book and the film, they get rid of him by sedating him, putting his ass in a straitjacket, and dragging him back to the States. In the show, they did something that really angered me that I'm not going to talk about. I'm pretty sure you can find out yourself. So that's all I can do right now. Compare and contrast MASH film, MASH show. And... I mean, that's all I can do right now. I, I can't think of much else. I could, probably, if you give me time. But right now, that's all I've got. So next time. Next time.